Ukraine is in crisis. What is the cost of war? Shattered lives, often children, destroyed homes and people fleeing the country for their safety. Russian bombing and shelling of cities and also in some cases civilian targets are continuing. A couple of days we've been looking up to the sound of explosions, fighter jets flying in the city. Is Russian President Vladimir Putin turning his country and economy into a casualty of war? Are international sanctions against Moscow affecting other nations that depend on Russian investment, particularly those in Africa? In terms of investment, Russia represents just 1% of uh, foreign direct investment efforts, not significant. Is Western media reporting the war in Ukraine fair and without bias? And is the war in Eastern Europe getting more media attention than wars in Africa, the Middle East and other parts of the world? Conflicts that have been going on for years. We will answer those questions and bring you in-depth reporting from Ukraine and expert analysis with our guests in Washington, New York and Johannesburg. Straight Talk Africa starts now. The headlines from Ukraine are constantly changing, but some of the trends in this war are now well established. The economic disruption that Russia's invasion has brought to Ukraine, the region and the world is rising. More importantly is the cost in lives and human suffering that comes with war. Associated Press correspondent Philip Crowther is in Lviv, Ukraine, where many are bracing for what, what might happen next as Russian forces continue their assault on the country. Philip, hello there. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, good to be with you. Uh, Philip, so you're about 70 kilometers from the Polish border right now, and Lviv is a key point for people leaving the country. Uh, what is it like to see um, all these people leaving? What do the streets in that city look and feel like? Well, look, it's a very strange uh, feeling here because uh, the streets are busy uh, here in Lviv. That might be because there are still people here. It uh, is a relatively safe place. In fact, right now, it is a safe place, a safe city. But those people that you see walking in the streets, they're not necessarily only people who live here and feel safe and might want to stay here, at least in the immediate future. There are a lot of refugees here, 200,000 here right now, according to the mayor of this city. And they, in some cases, if they have the possibility of getting accommodation, a place to stay, they can have a little bit of rest here uh, from their arduous journeys that they've taken here from all corners of Ukraine where they don't feel safe and are not safe right now. From here, an enormous amount of people are exiting the country. So what we see a lot of here at the train station is women and children fleeing this city. Though it is relatively safe, the ultimate aim is for people to get out of this country at war and to get to the neighboring countries, Poland being the country that has accepted the largest amount of refugees so far. Uh, Philip, apart from the men, of course, who have to stay behind and, and fight Russian forces, are you hearing about people who are unable to leave and who simply have to stay and weather it out? No, not necessarily. Of course, for some, it's more, more difficult to get out than for others. Uh, once you reach the other side of the border, say in Poland, for example, that's how uh, we entered Ukraine a few days ago. Uh, the lucky ones, of course, have transportation organized for them. Uh, there might be family uh, members or friends who might pick them up at the border, or uh, they're looking for transport further into Poland or indeed to any other country in the European Union. Uh, there are buses organized voluntarily. There are free rides to many members countries of the European Union. So that's the movement in one direction. But as you mentioned, there is movement in the other direction. Uh, there are Ukrainians, uh, men uh, who are coming from abroad, who've seen what's happened here and who are willing uh, to essentially go to war uh, with Russian forces here. So there is movement in the other direction toward the east, toward the capital city of Kiev and other places uh, that are under siege right now uh, from Russian forces. You see quite a lot of members of the territorial defense here. These are civilians who got military training from current uh, officers in the Ukrainian army or former officers uh, in the army who've been given weapons uh, just in case they need to use them. They might need to use them here. You never know. Uh, but others are moving to other places where they are uh, more needed at this point. 
Philip Crowther, thank you very much. That was Associated Press correspondent Philip Crowther in Lviv, Ukraine. Now, it is unclear if Russian President Vladimir Putin expected the sanctions that followed his invasion of Ukraine. However, their severity could have far-reaching economic consequences for Russia. Oksana Bedratenko has the story narrated by Anna Rice. As crippling sanctions begin to take effect in Russia following Moscow's invasion of Ukraine, some experts say Russian President Vladimir Putin may have been surprised by their severity. Daniel Fried is from Atlantic Council. I think Putin was surprised. I think the, Rus the Russian ruble tanked. Uh, the Russian retaliation announced on Monday suggests that the Russian economy is moving toward, they're not there yet, but moving toward a non-convertible non ruble. Uh, anybody my age or even younger knows what that means. That means a black market in Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay, That means a black market for dollars and a black market for things that dollars buy. Economist Yuri Gorodnichenko with the University of California, Berkeley, agrees that the sanctions could push Russia back into a Soviet-era economy. Russians need to think back to what was happening in the early 1990s, when inflation was huge and there was a sharp decline in economic growth. Will they want to get paid in car tires or pipes and oil? These scenarios are all possible. And the West, experts believe, has not exhausted their sanctions options. There is another sphere they can hit hard, the energy sector. But sanctions on energy will hurt the world, not just Russia. The trouble with this is, until there are sufficient alternative energy sources developed, it will be hard to do that. This is not, I don't like saying this, okay? If we stopped buying Russian oil and gas, they would find other markets for it very quickly especially oil, and the price, but the price would go up and it's possible Putin could make a windfall profit. The next round of sanctions might include even harsher restrictions imposed on Russian companies and harsher limits on energy exports, believe experts. What is also clear is that Russia may be gaining ground in Ukraine, but is losing the information war surrounding the invasion. I think they do understand. For one, there will be an open letter signed by 159 Nobel Prize laureates that oppose the war in Ukraine, urging Russia to stop the invasion. Scientists all over the world are speaking up against the invasion. Russian scientists have written an open letter opposing the war too. Protests around Russia make it clear that some ordinary citizens are also against Russia's decision to invade Ukraine. But what could be more telling is that some of the country's richest citizens, such as oligarch Mikhail Friedman and industrialist Oleg Deripaska, have also said they oppose Russia's actions. For Oksana Bedratenko in Washington, Anna Rice, VOA News. Well, joining me now to discuss the impact of international sanctions and to what extent they bite is Peter Pham, a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council think tank here in Washington. He's also the former United States Special Envoy for Africa's Sahel region. And with me here in studio is Miroslava Gongadze. She is VOA's Eastern Europe News Chief, and she leads the Voice of America's news coverage in the region. Uh, Peter and Miroslava, thank you very much for joining me. Welcome. Thank you for having us. Uh, Miroslava, I, I take it those who know Vladimir Putin better than most are probably his neighbors. Uh, are the sanctions imposed on Russia actually biting? Um, we, we're, Joe Biden, um, the president of the United States, Joe Biden, has now banned all Russian oil Im imports and has told Americans to brace for more pain. Um, what pain is Vladimir Putin feeling? Uh, it looks like the Russian economy is imploding. Basically, uh, all the international uh, international 
uh, corporations are uh, getting out of Russia. Uh, international corporations are leaving um, uh, leaving Moscow, leaving Russia. Uh, soon, uh, Russian people would not be able to buy uh, goods and they would not be able to enjoy uh, what they used to for many, many years. Uh, the biggest issue was the uh, was the McDonald's, iPhone, uh, IKEA, all the biggest, Zara, all the all the brands. They are all leaving uh, Russia. So uh, for for now, um, ra Russian people are not really. They don't know what's going on because the Russian propaganda is telling them that everything is great. However, when they uh, will come to the and they are coming to to the stores, they understand. They they see that they cannot buy their goods and they would be able to. They would not be able to enjoy uh, life as they uh, did before. And, uh, and just the sheer number of, of companies that have suspended operations there is, is quite shocking. Peter, what is your assessment of the way the US and the EU have used international sanctions to punish Vladimir Putin here? Uh, and could these sanctions have perhaps been used in a way that would have prevented Russia from invading Ukraine? Well, I think uh, with sanctions, it's always a question of the devil being in the detail, so to speak, uh, when those sanctions are implemented. Against whom specifically are they implemented? And so broadly speaking, I think certainly the world has come together. The United States and Europe have closed ranks uh, with other major developed economies like Japan uh, in a way that was unimaginable just a short time ago. So one has to acknowledge that qualitative difference. On the other hand, the, as I said, the devil in the details. Yet uh, President Biden announced a ban on U.S. imports of Russian oil and other energy products. But the details indicate that the ban will not take place for 45 more days. Uh, who knows what the military situation is going to be like uh, six weeks from now. So I think that that, that has to be perhaps we would have been unable before the Russian invasion to rally this unity of support. Uh, but on the other hand, I think some mixed signals were sent early in this administration. The lifting of sanctions on the Nord Stream 2, for example, I think may have been perceived one way by the Biden administration, intended one way, and read in an entirely different way by both Putin and Russia and our European friends. Uh, Miroslava, we're getting a clearer picture of exactly who Vladimir Putin's enemies are right now and, and how powerful they are. But who is still with him, as far as you know and from the reporting that you've done, who is still in his inner circle and who are his most powerful friends right now? Uh, if we look at the uh, latest um, security council that uh, Putin led uh, before invasion, you can actually count all those people. People, there are a couple of, look, there are probably seven Seven, uh, eight, seven people who are around him. And from uh, journalists uh, in Moscow and uh, my reporting, uh, it's, uh, it's kind of understandable that these people are not uh, planning to quit uh, Putin. They are around him and they are very, very tight, uh, have a tight relationship with him. And from what I'm hearing from experts uh, and people in, in around the circle, they are saying that they would... Uh, go ahead and fulfill every direction or every um, uh, goal that Putin uh, wants them to uh, to to do. So they are. Uh, it doesn't look like um, the split uh, in in Kremlin is uh, is is coming, and nobody believes that uh, anyone from the circle uh, would uh, would uh, turn his back against Putin. Peter, is that the the in here for for the um, for the Americans and for the Europeans uh, to target that inner circle? From what history has taught us, your your experience, is that what works? If you can't target the strong man to the point where you know he gives up, you go after his inner circle, and has that been proven to be effective? Uh, it's not just the inner circle, but also those who enable. In, in no country, is it all, anywhere, is it one man rule or even a collective leadership? It's the, the infrastructure, the ecosystem that supports them. And I think as the sanctions take their toll, not just on the lives of ordinary Russian men, women, and children,
but upon many of the oligarchs who are having their yachts impounded, their assets frozen, increased sanctions on them and their families, their ability to move about to a system that supports that inner circle that Miroslava spoke about, that's going to wear away. It may not be in a day or a week, but over time, that's what's really going to bring down or change a regime. Miroslava, we've seen reporting now that U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken has reassured Baltic countries, uh, Latvia, Estonia and Lithuania, that NATO will protect them. Uh, how nervous are these countries? And then how nervous is a country like Moldova, which, of course, is a non-NATO country, but also has pro-Russian separatist regions like Ukraine had? Uh, how real is the sense of concern and, and fear? Um, and how real should it be? It's a, it's a very real. Uh, all those countries um, understand that they can be, they could be next. Uh, in uh, in Putin's, Putin is trying to uh, to um, uh, reorganize former Soviet Union. He's he clearly stated that Ukraine. He doesn't see Ukraine as a uh, as an independent real country. Uh, he basically does not uh, see uh, Moldova or Georgia as real countries. I mean, we know that Mold he occupied part of. Russia occupied part of Moldova and Russia occupied part of uh, Georgia. Uh, Poland, uh, who uh, that embrace, embracing uh, more than already embraced more than a million uh, Ukrainian refugees, are really uh, uh, feeling the pain of of this of this war. So all those countries are screaming out loud to their partners in NATO help Ukraine, support Ukraine, because if Ukraine will fall, um, we will be next. So for them, it's a, it's a real tragedy and a real um, fear uh, that they try to uh, explain to their partners in, uh, in NATO, more Western European partners in NATO. Is there a sense um, in the Ukraine and um, amongst its leaders that Historically, um, the West has been too lenient um, with Vladimir Putin. That Absolutely. they were not tough enough on them, even after Crimea, um, you know, that it was this back and forth sanctions, imposed sanctions lifted, uh, and that he kind of dodged all of that and and now look at what we have. Absolutely, I mean, and not only Ukrainians, um, I would say Baltic states and Poland, they um, they think that uh, containment uh, policy didn't really work and that Putin were allowed to do whatever he wanted in the region for many years. And that's why he um, felt emboldened to go ahead with this um, uh, tragic invasion. Um, Putin uh, made his uh, decision probably a long time ago and if uh, those in the West would listen to his speeches over the years uh, starting with Munich, uh, Munich address um, we would understand that he is trying to build his military, he's trying to rebuild Soviet Union, he has a lot of grievances toward the West, and that's why he's doing what he's doing. And I really don't see, uh, an expert don't see um, him stopping. Uh, the, and, and everybody's right now looking for a way how to stop him, but uh, he's very resolute, resolute in, in, his, in his goals. Uh, for, first of all, to destroy Ukraine, and he uh, s s sees Russia as a castle who that doesn't need the world. They does doesn't need to communicate with the world. Uh, the 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 Russia who ha that has a lot of resources that they can uh, sustain itself uh, by itself. And he um, famously said that we don't need the world without Russia. He meant. Uh, without Russia, like uh, with his leadership. So this is very dangerous, dangerous situation right now. And um, I think West uh, should uh, do more to actually help Ukraine to withstand, uh, uh, withstand Putin today.
Miroslav, we're going to check in with you again um, in, in coming weeks um, as things progress. Of course, we don't expect this is going to all just be over tomorrow, but um, we would really, we really appreciate your reporting and all the work you're doing there. Um, and we'll check in with you again. Thank you so much for your time Thank here. You. Um, and Peter, please stay with me. I'm going to ask you to just hang on as we continue this discussion after the break. We're going to ask, what does the vote of African countries at the United Nations say about their relationship with Russia? Moreover, what those votes could mean for their ties to the US and EU countries. Straight of Africa will be back after the break. Health, wellness, sport, beauty, medical breakthroughs. Healthy Living cares about your well-being. What are the main health concerns in Africa and around the world? Find out the latest on coronavirus. Connect with our experts and ask them questions. How long does the virus stay? Join me, Lino Khmudu, in Washington every week on Healthy Living, right here on VOA. This is not our war. Those words have been echoing from Africans at home and abroad in recent weeks as the Russia-Ukraine war puts pressure on African countries to essentially make their positions clear. Now, when the United Nations General Assembly voted overwhelmingly to condemn Russia, 17 African countries abstained. Eritrea voted against the resolution, along with Russia, Belarus, Syria and North Korea. South Africa was among the countries that did not support the motion. President Cyril Ramaphosa has defended his neutral stance on Russia's invasion, calling for talks, not condemnation. And as Linda Givetash reports, critics have blasted Ramaphosa's government, saying South Africa is allowing historical, political and economic ties with Moscow to risk relations with the rest of the world. I'm Linda Givetash in Johannesburg, South Africa. President Cyril Ramaphosa said last week he's been asked to mediate talks in the Russia-Ukraine conflict. He did not specify whether it was Russia or another party that made the request, but the announcement came after he spoke with his Russian counterpart Vladimir Putin. Some experts say the request is no surprise given South Africa's neutral stance on the conflict. South Africa abstained from a United Nations vote earlier this month to reprimand Russia over its invasion of neighboring Ukraine. Experts say South Africa was acting in line with its foreign policy to remain neutral and call for negotiations. Although some say it's inexplicable to not condemn violence inflicted on a sovereign nation. Ramaphosa tweeted remarks he gave to reporters on Saturday saying Putin expressed appreciation for South Africa's abstention at the UN vote. But it remains unclear whether Ukraine will see Ramaphosa as a neutral party. South Africa has long ties with Russia. It's a member of the BRICS economic bloc, which includes Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Historically, the Soviet Union also provided support to the South Africa's now ruling African National Congress, or ANC, to fight against the racist apartheid regime. A foundation led by the country's former president and ANC leader Jacob Zuma has gone as far as to recently issue a statement in support of Putin. Officially, South Africa has flip-flopped on its stance. The country's International Relations Department issued a statement last month calling on Russia to withdraw its forces from Ukraine. Since then, the call has been removed from official statements. Instead, President Ramaphosa has taken a softer stance and notably has not referred to the conflict as an invasion. Whether Ramaphosa will ultimately play a role in Russia-Ukraine talks is yet to be seen. Experts say bigger questions remain over where the talks would take place and what would be on the agenda, although a ceasefire is likely to be the first priority. Well, back with me now is Ambassador Peter Pham, a distinguished fellow at the Atlantic Council here in Washington. He's also a former United States Special Envoy for the Sahel region of Africa. Peter, thank you for being back with me. Uh, now, when it comes to war, of course, we know fairness just goes out the window. But should African countries be expected to essentially take sides in this conflict? Well, I think there's a difference between taking sides uh, in terms of supplying uh, uh, one co combatant or another. or But there's another thing about taking a stand with the international community. Uh, the good news is a majority of African states, I think, uh, stood up 
uh, their responsibilities as members of the international community. At the UN resolution against the invasion of Ukraine, 28 African states, a majority of them, voted for the resolution, 17 abstained, eight were not even present, and only one, Eritrea, voted against the resolution. So uh, that's a good thing. Uh, likewise, at the UN uh, Commission, uh, Council on Human Rights, only one African country uh, voted against investigating human rights, humanitarian law violations, and other war crimes in Ukraine. That was, again, Eritrea. So the majority of African states uh, did well by their responsibility. Unfortunately, uh, a large number also tried to absent themselves from history or having to uh, take a stand. And I think that's something that uh, is still a work in progress. Now, speaking of that vote at the UN, if we do look closer at the way that African countries voted, as, as you outlined, those who abstained, those who didn't vote at all, um, this was to, of course, reprimand Russia, uh, but nearly half of all the 35 countries that abstained were African. We saw um, South African President Cyril Ramaphosa sort of defend his neutral stance. But uh, what do the way these African countries have voted reveal about their relationships with Russia? I think it, it varies. Uh, for some, it's a bit of nostalgia. Uh, based on whether the old Soviet Union may have supported national liberation uh, struggles uh, in the past. Uh, South Africa, I think, falls very much in that category. Uh, the, the support the ANC had, its partnership with the South African Communist Party, which endures to today. Uh, and then there are the countries who perhaps are in an awkward position. Central African Republic, for example, where uh, the Wagner Group, a uh, group of private security group with very close ties to Putin is integrally involved in the security of the state uh, as well as in the, in the management of the country, to be quite frank. Uh, Mali, which also abstained, where there is, again, Russian presence uh, in the fight against terrorists in that country. So I think there's, there's a bit of a, a mixed bag. And then there are some countries whose vote is utterly inexplicable. Uh, Eritrea being a classic example, if you're a small state next to a very large state that could potentially have reason to deny the legitimacy of your state, one would have thought if anyone would have understood Ukraine's position, uh, it would have been Eritrea. But there it was, Eritrea, the only African vote against the, U the United Nations resolution and the only vote in the entire world with Russia at the Human Rights Council. Uh, Pete, and of course, these sanctions don't go without any economic pain on the West. Uh, is it fair for anyone to expect that many of these African countries who have smaller economies, who are not superpowers, who don't sort of have the same economic wherewithal that the US or other European countries um, have, is it fair to expect them to absorb sort of great economic pain in order to stand with the West and inflict pain on Russia? Well, none of these votes were to... Uh, impose sanctions. They were to defend a uh, principle of international law about the sovereignty of countries, the integrity of borders. I think uh, mm -hmm. the permanent representative of Kenya, uh, Ambassador Martin Kimani, gave a very eloquent speech at the Security Council, which Kenya represents Africa as one of the permanent members, lay out why it is that Africa needs to take the stand on this principle. And I, so I would refer everyone to Ambassador Kimani's address. But as to the economic consequences, yes, there's going to be pain all around because of these sanctions. But I do think the international community uh, needs to pay attention to perhaps the disproportion, disproportionate exposure that Africa does have to uh, the sanctions and just the simple displacement that war causes. For example, uh, in recent days, the price of a bushel of wheat globally, uh, the benchmark Chicago Board of Trade price, has soared to records uh, never seen before, uh, more than $13. It's now settled down to about $12.80 a bushel. But that's still almost many Africans are very dependent upon uh, imports of wheat from Russia, Ukraine, uh, and corn. Uh, a lot of Southern Africa uh, relies on corn from Ukraine. Corn that's not going to ship because of the, the conflict, uh, not because of sanctions, but simply because of the conflict.
And then, of course, talk about food security. We have the issue of fertilizer. Russia's the largest uh, exporter of fertilizer in the world. The price of ammonia has almost tripled over the course of the last year. And already Africa uses less fertilizer per hectare than any region in the world. And this is going to drive the price even further, uh, leading to less productivity and therefore a spiral downward of increasing uh, food prices. So we have to look at the uh, at the knock on effects for many vulnerable economies. Peter, with with Russia's attention and resources focused on its war in Eastern Europe, what does this mean for Moscow's commitments that it has made in Africa? Will it be able to follow through on deals, promises, investments? So do African countries now become less of a priority for Russia? Well, uh, I do think that uh, one has to put this into context. Although there's been a great deal of attention paid to uh, Russian military sales, and Russia does sell more weapons to Africa than uh, the next five exporters of arms uh, put together. So in, that might be a good thing, actually, for the African Union's campaign to silence the, the arms, to silence the guns, to have fewer of them flowing in. But in terms of investment, Russia represents just 1% of foreign direct investment efforts, not significant. Uh, but the lack of attention certainly will mean uh, certain countries uh, will be disproportionately impacted. Uh, we talk about food prices, but there's also fuel prices. Uh, clearly, we've seen the price of barrel of oil gone up tremendously. Now, that will benefit over time certain African producers. But ironically, some of those same countries also import fuel uh, or subsidize and going to cause a yawning budget deficit for a number of governments. So there are a lot of challenges that Africa is going to face as a result of not just the sanctions, but just the knock on effects of uh, conflict uh, in Eurasia. Peter Pham, thank you so much for your insights and thank you so much for joining me. We're going to take another break here and when Straight Talk Africa returns, still stuck in a war zone, we'll speak to a Zimbabwean student trying to escape the fighting in Ukraine and we'll discuss why the media is in the headlines for its coverage of the war in Eastern Europe. My guests Mimi Kalinda and Mustafa Bayumi will join me right after the break. Straight Talk Africa, welcome back. We continue our coverage of African students and expats caught in the conflict in Eastern Europe. As African governments work to evacuate their citizens, hundreds of African students remain stuck in the city of Sumy in northeastern Ukraine. They say they are living in fear as conflict rages and bombs explode around them. VOA's Mike Hove reached Zimbabwean student Jordan Bopoto in the city of Sumy. I'm Jordan Bopoto, and I'm speaking from Sumi. I'm a student at uh, Sumi State University in Ukraine. Yeah. Let's talk a little more about your well-being and how things are going for you. Right now, it's just safe to say I'm just hanging in there. It's crazy. Like, the situation is crazy, yeah? How are things looking like in Sumi? 
in the beginning, Sumi was like, like just quiet. You know, it was peaceful, like nothing much going on in Sumi. But like for the past couple of days, we've been waking up to the sound of explosions, fighter jets flying in the city. You sometimes you get notified of the street fights, like street fights going on. So you have to be like um, extra alert, and sometimes you have to like uh, go into the underground shelters uh, to to shelter from these uh, attacks. You know. Mm-hmm. Walk me through what a normal day, or normal in quotes, day looks like for you right now. It must be very uh, eventful, for lack of a better word. If you spend a day without going to the bunker, and then you know, like this, like that day is not normal. Like for you to like to say you have had a like a proper day, like a, a full day, like you have to at least yeah, at least one explosion, at least you have to get, to get a message to run to rush to the bunker. And uh, recently, we've been having electric uh, problems because apparently they they destroyed one of the power plants of Sumi, so the the whole city was a, a, a total blackout. But now they are like working on fixing it. So now there's electricity in some places, and in, in, in other places there's still no e- electricity. Mm-hmm. And then we also have the the water problem. There's no water in Sumi. Uh, yeah, it's. It go to to that extent where we had to like collect snow, we had to collect snow, try to melt it uh, so that we get like some water maybe to clean the the dishes or do something like that. Um, with all this happening, are you guys able to get out to buy food? Are uh, you able to access other things? What's going on there? Okay, uh, so as it stands right now, uh, the like the city is like on its own. It's been trying so hard to, pro- to provide food for people. Sometimes we have people who are coming in with uh, some contributions. They come to our hostels. They give uh, they give out water. They give out eggs. Sometimes they even bring potatoes and they give out to the to the people. But as of the shops, like they're not like they're not fully functional. They only open them maybe for from eight to at least three, and then they close. And now like we have the curfew, so you can be seen like roaming around after six. For those that would help you personally as a student, how do you think they could help you? I, I don't know, I'm co- <laughs> Okay, I, I need help, I need to, I need to be able to get out of Sumi. I need to get out of Sumi. I need to, you know, I was talking to my friends all the other time and we were talking like, you know, people in Sumi, they're going through uh, a little of like the under pressure like an emotional drift like everything is just too much for you it's just too much to handle and i don't people are jumpy and i was you know I, I was like loving with my friend at that time right now you have to like you 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 jump at the sound of the door closing so it's people may not like uh think like this is serious or, or like they like they've seen it from a movie, mm-hmm. but like we are living it, we are experiencing it. So like one of my friends like just said this, I don't think any, any, anyone of us will be able to enjoy the sound of firecrackers or those fireworks or, or things like that. It was, it's not looking good, it's, it's not nice for us. Okay, well, uh, Jordan, uh, thank you for taking time out to, to, to give us your account of what's happening. Um, and we really would, would we really appreciate it. And please, okay. by all means, stay safe, stay safe. Okay, uh, thank you for having me. VOA's Mike Hove, they're speaking to Zimbabwean student Jordan Boporto in northeastern Ukraine. Mike, thank you. Now, global media coverage of the war in Ukraine has come under scrutiny. There's a heated debate online about whether international media reporting about Russia's invasion of the Eastern European country exposes a Western bias or double standard. Critics say the conflict in Eastern Europe has received more media attention and, as a result, more public attention than ongoing conflicts in places like, say, Ethiopia or Yemen. And joining me now to discuss this is Mimi Kalinda. She is in Johannesburg, South Africa. Mimi is the founder and CEO of Africa Communications Media Group. And also with us is writer, journalist and professor Mustafa Bayoumi. He is the author of the book 
How does it feel to be a problem being young and Arab in America? And he joins us from New York. Mustafa and Mimi, hello and a warm welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks for having me. Mimi, I'm going to start with you. Now, we've seen the coverage of Africans who were trapped and some who still are trapped in the conflict zone in Eastern Europe. What is your assessment of how these particular stories have been covered in terms of the amount of attention they have received in international media and the urgency with which they have been reported on? Yeah, hey, Dee, thank you so much. And I think, uh, you know, I have to, I have to almost, you know, just... Uh, force myself to wake up when I think about the fact that it's 2022 and we're still talking about this. Um, uh, looking at the coverage that's that's been uh, been put out about Africans that are trapped in Ukraine, trying to get out and really going through this humanitarian crisis alongside everything else, um, I think it's been a huge pity to see both the amount of coverage but also the quality of coverage and the consequences that come with the quality of that coverage, um, i.e. what the broadcasters and media outlets are saying or not saying uh, about what they're they're allowing to go on the air. So my assessment is that, um, you know, we're definitely not getting the full story. I have to say, however, that, you know, and this is something I've said often, whoever owns the mic owns the message. So there is something to be said about you know, the ownership of the media and who's really behind these media houses and how much coverage we end up getting, um, you know, for for people of color, um, let's, let's be honest. Uh, but not enough coverage and the quality of the coverage, and I'm sure you'll come to that at some point, has been pitiful and, and uh, at, for 2022, I think to a certain level, completely despicable. Uh, Mustafa, what has this conflict and the way it has been covered by international media, especially the reporters, the news anchors and the officials who had made um, race-based references and remarks, what has all of this revealed to you? Well, unfortunately, it reveals to me a pervasive sense of a, of a European superiority complex. It, it actually goes back, I think, all the way to a kind of colonial history. I mean, we're hearing words bandied about like these people look like they're civilized and when they're talking about the Ukrainians crossing the border, as opposed to other refugee flows uh, from Asia and Africa and Latin America. Uh, these kinds of uh, this kind of talk is, is reminiscent, I think, really, of all the way going all the way back to the 18th and 19th century. Um, and it's deeply, deeply disturbing. I mean, my heart, of course, I, I, I am bleeding for the people of Ukraine. I think this is an aggression, uh, an aggression that should not be accepted. As, as I feel that that's the case in so many places around the world, somebody who comes from the Middle East, I, I'm, I'm not unfamiliar with these kinds of images and the kinds of sympathy that they should be evoking in all of us. Uh, and yet this particular conflict seems to be evoking or seems to be stoked to evoke a certain kind of response from Western audiences that our other refugee flows do not. Uh, Mimi, what's your take on, on those specific remarks that we had seen um, in international media? Uh, because like you said, you know, sometimes you've got to just check what century are, are we in. But clearly some feel this and, and others don't. Yeah, you know, I, I read a, a very interesting quote recently by Lucy Watson, who's an international correspondent that's actually taken it upon herself to to speak out about uh, the kind of coverage that we've been seeing. And she said, you know, the unthinkable happened uh, or is happening in Ukraine at the moment. Um, and the unthinkable cannot be associated with Europe. Um, the unthinkable is associated automatically with what we call, call the quote unquote third world. Um, so um, it, it is really a, a pity, but I think for me, uh, two things um, at this point, um, you know, there's been a lot of activism around this issue. Um, I would love to be able to see a response somewhere by someone from these international uh, news outlets, um, you know, apologizing at the very least, but also, you know, really taking the time to dig into the why and how do we move forward from here? 
And the second thing is, I think it's it's really a call to action. Also, um, you know, I think for for leaders in Africa and, and and other places around the world, that we really need to start reporting our own stories um, because I think there's a level of ignorance um, on, on the part of of international media outlets that only we can really fix by educating and partnering. And 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 uh, and working together to to make sure that these ignorant comments um, are no longer relevant. Um, because I don't know whether they stem from ignorance or, um, or or whether they're deliberate. But either way, I think we can condemn or we can work together to overcome these challenges in the future. Uh, now, Mustafa, anyone who is who who comes from an African country or from that region or from the Middle East, when we see the images coming out of Ukraine, I mean, you, your first reaction is you've seen this, you know, you have some idea of the the toll and the impact, and the, so you feel the humanity here. But this is what what the media here is is at fault. You say for um, you use the word tribalism. You say tribalism is at play here. That's a loaded word. What do you mean by that? I think that these kinds of catastrophes that we're witnessing are human catastrophes. They should be, they should be um, um, pushing our hearts as human beings, not because we share the same skin color or because we share the same faith or, or we dress the same or we have, we have cars that look the same. These are some of the comments that were made in the media. Those kinds of comments are saying we are like these people because of our very superficial similarities. And that, I think, is a kind of modern tribalism. I completely disagree with that notion. I think that if we're ever going to be able to live uh, in peace and prosperity with one another, we have to see each other all as part of one human family. And that means not seeing European uh, uh, catastrophes as separate from the other catastrophes that are happening around the world. And in fact, what it really means is trying to not have any more of these catastrophes happen in, at all. Uh, so I, I, I'm waiting. Uh, uh, and actively searching for that data come. Maybe what is the right balance here? Because sometimes when wars and conflicts in Africa are covered, um, there is criticism saying, well, the international media or the Western media, they only cover Africa's wars and the negative things that happen in Africa. I mean, here at VOA, we've had that criticism lobbed at us as well. And, you know, I'm from the continent. Um, we, I, I kind of have a different view when you're from there about how you approach it, how you, you, you're kind of a little sensitive to and you, you, you want to bring the other side to it sides that we don't often talk about. But now we also see that the, the criticism that this war in Europe is getting more media attention than conflicts in Africa and the Middle East. How, in your view, should the media strike the balance here? So I think there's a number of, of, of different things that we have to look at. I think earlier I spoke a, a little bit about media ownership. I mean, you know, I, I, I think that there is definitely a lot of work to be done um, on the part of Africans and particularly those of us that are in the media space to make sure that we create additional platforms, especially in the world in which we live, where we have access to so many digital tools, to tell a more fair, a more balanced and a truer um, story in terms of, you know, what happens in Africa, um, you know, whether it's in conflict or non-conflict times. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, what's happening with, with the international media outlets, I really believe that it is a partnership. I don't, um, I, I don't think that we, we do enough um, to, to, um, to bring the issue to the fore, but also to partner with our media colleagues across the pond um, in the global community to say, you know, um, you know this, we don't agree with how these issues are reported and this would be a fairer, a truer, a more balanced way of going about reporting. And I think that there's a lot of education that needs to go into this. Um, and hopefully that will, will begin to, to shift the needle in the right direction. Uh, Mustafa, this is, of course, all um, drawn a backlash from the other side of the debate about, you know, this is about Ukraine. Don't make this about Africa. Don't make this about the Middle East. This is happening now. Um, this has consequences now. Um, as someone who has written about that, because I know others who have have received um, a terrible backlash to the point that, the, you know, they didn't even want to talk or feel OK talking to us about it anymore. Have you received that kind of backlash? And if so, what, what's that been like? Oh yes, uh, I mean this. This article generated um, copious amounts of commentary, 
um, back to me. Um, much of it, I have to say, though, much of it very positive. Right? Many people recognized, I think, the outrageousness of this kind of double standard that we're seeing here. Uh, but certainly there was a sense of, you know, you don't know what you're talking about and you don't have the right to talk about this. Uh, even though as a member of the media, I think I absolutely have the right to criticize uh, the, the institution of the media. Uh, and it's not only the media either, unfortunately. It's also the ways in which this turns into policy. And what I think is also a, another tragedy upon this is the way that we see um, different people who have been made into refugees turned into political pawns. And uh, we've seen that, for example, in the past with uh, the situation on the Belarusian border with Poland. And there was very little media coverage or not sufficient media coverage of that, that conflict or that situation, which is ongoing to this day. And yet we're told at the same time that we shouldn't be talking about what's going on in Ukraine because uh, uh, it's, a, it's a pressing issue at the moment. I, I completely disagree. And I think that criticism is the only way forward. Uh, Mimi, I'm going to end with you. What has this crisis revealed about what, how much, let's say, Western media or international media have learned up to now about recovering, about covering these sensitive issues and reporting uh, on, on Africa, on African people, and similar situations in other parts of the world that are, that are not part of the Western world. Uh, and how far do you think we've come and how far do you think we still need to go? I honestly felt that we had come quite far before this crisis, I have to be honest. I feel that this has taken us back a couple of decades. Um, so much has happened in the, in the world of activism on this particular issue. Uh, we've spoken out uh, on numerous occasions where we've been in the same situation. Um, and it just doesn't seem like the message has landed. Um, I have to say I've been quite surprised and shocked. Um, at the things that I've heard and seen um, in the media lately. So um, I think there's still a lot of work to do. Um, I think that, you know, we, there are a number of different approaches. We can point the finger and continue to um, to complain about this because it is uh, it is definitely something that is uh, that, that's that's shocking. Or we can think about a completely different approach. How do we work together to change the narrative? It's not a one-sided thing. I don't think that changing the narrative of Africa, of how, how, how brown people around the world are reported on, um, is, is a one-sided effort. I think we all need to work together, and perhaps we're not doing enough of that. Uh, Mimi and Mustafa, what a great conversation. I wish we had more time, but thank you so much for joining us here on Straight Talk Africa. I do appreciate you coming and sharing your perspectives with us. Thank you, Heidi. And finally, a number of African students studying in Western Ukraine were evacuated to their countries of origin. They are now watching the unraveling of the situation there and wondering when and if they are going to go back and continue their studies. Reporter Issa Ali caught up with two Ghanaian medical students who recently made it back home to Accra. I go to Ghana on the 1st of March, 2022. When I go home, I go home on Monday, um, 1st of March, 2022. And this is due to, like I said, the Ukraine-Russia crisis. That led me to come back to Ghana. I was studying in Bukovenian State Medical University in Chenevsi, the western part of Ukraine. I studied medicine in Chenevsi, um, a university called Bukovenian State Medical University. At departure to the border, we had constant conversations with the government. Um, we started preaching um, calmness. We started telling people that if you have the available funds and you can fly back home, you should fly back home. So through the NUCS, the National Union of Ghanaian Students um, Ukraine, um, we, we issued communiques, we issued, I mean, we had meetings upon meetings to preach this. I went to the administration to get the students cleared to inform the school that we are leaving. So we told our school, the school um, agreed, they called the Romanian consular that their students will be coming to the border and then they should grant them a pass. We, I informed the national presidency and also we told, we told the government that these are the students we are coming with and then they should be aware we are coming. So we got a letter from the ministry whilst at the border. And so on the 25th of um, February, 2022, I, I together with my friends and the student union leaders, we organized a bus and then we decided to 
head to Ghana. Uh, I mean, get out of the country, Ukraine. I've never experienced any any sort of thing like this in my life before, so it was quite challenging for me. When I got to the border, I had to throw my luggage inside the yard so I can go as a free man, I mean, without any luggage or thing. So when I did that, I had it in the back of my mind or in the back of my mind that any way, any means that I would used to enter the um, the gates of Romania, I would do that. So I stood there for hours, and finally I was able to pass through the border. The issue at the border, for our experience, I can't talk for, I mean, people, but I mean, people from have different or diverse views as to how, what they encountered at the border. For me and my people on the 25th at the border, um, the order was straight from the military. They said women and children first. And when they say women and children, it doesn't matter your color, it doesn't matter where you're from, whether you're Ukrainian, whether you're European, whether you're African. If you find your way in front of the queue, or I mean in front of the gate, you'll be granted a pass. So that was the order we, we got from the military. I mean, after we crossed the Romanian border, they were giving us food. I actually felt like a refugee, but I mean, I don't come from Ukraine, so you can't call me a refugee. I was just going back to my country because of what was happening in Ukraine. Yeah, so we're given food and a place to, to cool ourselves, I mean, to, to, to keep ourselves warm a little because it was the temperature was quite uh, cold. It was cold there, so we got some tea from the Romanians, and then they treated us so well. I was surprised, and then I was really happy to have fallen in the arms of these people. And so we had to wait for the others to come and then the bus was arranged for us. So um, for me, as soon as I got to Romania, I mean, I'll commend the Church of Pentecost also helping us to get a bus and secure a hotel for the first time, for, for our first um, journey to Sitiaba. And from there, we went to Bucharest where the government of Ghana also intervened and they came on our aid. Um, they sent on our journey on, on their behalf. He took us to, an, an, to a hotel and... From there, we they booked flights for us. We arrived in Ghana on the 1st of March. It's, they are international students only. I'm in touch with Africans, I'm, I'm not Ghanaians only, Africans. When I say Africans, Nigerians were in my school, Zimbabweans were in my school, some were in my class, um, Egyptians, some were in my school, Indians, some of them were in my school. So I'm in touch with all of them. We talk and we, we are still lamenting on this whole thing and hoping that it will come to a halt. I'm African, but when we got to the border, there were no students, there were no, uh, I mean, tax for students, tax for whoever, no titles were given there. So we were all treated the same way, but of course, the soldiers on the border were Ukrainian soldiers, and so they are going to allow their citizens to get out of their country first. So they were treated special. And I won't say I wasn't treated special. I just want, I, I really didn't care about being treated special or not. I just wanted a way to get out of the country. That was it. So when we got there, um, they were allowing kids and mothers to cross the border first. It feels great to see my family. Um, I'm very much happy. But um, there's one pressing issue right now. Some students are still stuck at the border. Some are also I mean, stuck in a community called Sumi. And um, they don't know what to do. Lights are out, foods are in short shortage, roads are are no are, are not working, buses are not working. You can't move in and out. Russians have taken over there, and it's very worrisome because we don't know what to happen. And because of this, um, I can't fully be happy, and I can't celebrate the victory that I am back home safe. And that is our show this week. Thank you to all my guests and our affiliate stations airing this show throughout the African continent. And a big thanks to you for joining us on television, radio, and online. Until the next time, from our team here in Washington, goodbye.